So this is part two of today's talk series and I am kind of incredibly honoured to have Monique Simmons here who is kind of one of the most sort of interesting and, and um, I don't know, political and, and social kind of informants on my mind over the last couple of years whilst developing this project and the work she has done with the innovation unit at Kew Gardens and the Millennium Seed Bank has um, provided us with a wealth of information that could have been lost easily um, and yeah it's a real honor to have you here today thank you very um, much. so I'll hand over to Monique um, thank you and uh, really representing here different aspects of work at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew on um, medicinal plants that we've been undertaking over the last say 30 years especially on my side and the development to, down at Wakers Place with the seed conservation department there of the Millennium Seed Bank which is the opportunity of saving seeds from around the world that are actually very important to, um, to mankind um, that are used by people that sometimes those that often get overlooked and that's the wild relatives of crop plants but also our medicinal plants but I'd like to tell you about some of the stories that I, I've had and then come back really to UK plants I mean, I've been working in this area for the um, last, well, cool, over 30 years, let's just say. Um, different parts of the world, um, about 80 different countries actually, finding out about plants. I'm not a botanist. I'm actually an um, entomologist stroke neurobiologist that got involved in plants and came to Kew because Arthur Bell, who was one of the, one of the directors um, back in 1983, was working on Parkinson's disease and um, we were doing some work on some plants that possibly could have some cures and he was interested to see if we could develop this type of work and understanding the medicinal plants at Kew and so I came and joined the team at Kew and really haven't found anywhere else to go since that has provided kind of the, the resources the freedom to be able to go and investigate in different countries, etc. And it's been a fascinating career. So, and the more I've kind of worked with plants, the more I find that I think I know more, but actually I think I learn less as time goes on. Um, and that is really understanding how medicinal plants have evolved, how they've been selected by people, we really don't understand that. Why did somebody over the years select one plant and not another's? Uh, for example, some of the work that we did um, with other colleagues at Kew, um, that was uh, William Milligan, who's an ethnobotanist, who did work with the Yamahami Indians um, at, uh, in, in parts of Brazil. He was interested in the, the uses of plants for treating um, malaria. And he collected 128 um, species from um, the, Yamaha, well, the, the Yamaha, Yamahami Indians were using. And he brought some of those to Kew with the idea that we would actually, along with the London School of Tropical Medicine, evaluate their activity. Now, 68 of those plants had really potent activity in, in, in screens. So there was a justification for going further. And some of that work was done at Kew, and again, some of it was done quite correctly in Brazil, because the plants came from Brazil. So the project went on, we moved on to other things. One of those plants was a Plactanthus, which is a member of the herb family related to your uh, your salvias, um, your thymes, etc. And it's a group of plants that are used frequently uh, for medicines in parts of Africa. And we were doing a survey of, some, of this genus and its particular uses in Africa. And lo and behold, one of those plants that was used for treating malaria was the same as had been used by the Yamahami Indians. Now the twist to this is the plant is more indigenous to Africa, not South America. So how did a plant in Africa 
get used by the Yamahami Indians for, for treating fevers, because of course the perception possibly wasn't malaria, it would have been treating fevers. So this is where you start to go into kind of a detective story into how possibly could have it been transferred and used. We think it was taken by the Portuguese as part of their plant, you know, plant medica, their medicines. It was then adopted for cure for, for fevers, um, impossibly by the Amami, because it was better than something else that was locally used. Because people, you know, will select, basically, if something's going to be used continually, usually has to have you know, some activity. The other thing about it, it was never used by itself. It was always in, used in combination with other plants. And I think that's something that we're learning far more about. As you go back and you look at the history of plants, it's very different from our magic bullet approach where you take you know, one medicine. It's often a combination of plants that are used. And I think this really comes to the fore when you look at traditional Chinese medicines when it's at least about five, if not 12, 13, 14 different plants that are used together. That kind of composition is important. But even if you're taking one plant, you're going to have a cocktail of compounds in that plant that are most likely going to be associated with a medicinal property. And I think there are challenges. I'm a scientist, so I'm interested in understanding how these plants actually work. And the challenge is that we often try and make extracts from that plant to identify what the actives are. And we are doing it in artificial situations. We've got a cell-based assay. We're not mimicking what happens in the body. You make an infusion, you drink it. It's then absorbed by your gut and it's transferred then to the parts of the, the body where the receptors are. That, the targets for your ailments. So it's most likely affecting your immune system, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, due to that combination of compounds that are in that plant. And what we're often doing is artificially separating that. And it's not surprising, therefore, that I think it's very difficult at times to repeat and explain exactly how a medicinal plant works. But again, we try to. Why do we try to? Because in a way, if you're trying to get something regulated, you have to explain how it works. And that's a challenge that we have when we're trying to move from a traditional use of a plant to getting it through the regulations so that it can be standardized and therefore available, say, to the general public um, by a, you know, a product that you can buy rather than being given, say, by herbalists as an um, infusion that they make and therefore they, they can treat their patients. Now, why is this possibly important? Well, I think it is because there's less of a knowledge about many plants compared to possibly some years ago. There's often a breakdown in that link between plants um, or your, your, your environment and your ailments and therefore the selection of plants. And if you talk to a doctor, I mean, you know, take doctor 200 years ago, they most likely would have been using medicinal plants. That would have been the main form of, of medicines. But how many of our doctors now have got any training in botany or in the use of plants. Very few of them. There's an increasing interest, and that is led by the demand of the interest in um, herbal remedies. Complementary therapies is really coming to the fore. And going back to something you were saying about the traditional Chinese medicines, I think we've got a lot to learn um, from their use because they use modern medicines as well as herbs in many of their um, hospitals. They're trained for about seven years to, do, to be able to do this combinations. And you very rarely in China would find somebody giving you a traditional herbal um, combination and, unless they're fully trained. It's not always the case here. When something goes wrong in the UK, 
has occurred a few years ago with traditional uh, Chinese medicine was the case of aristolochic acid toxicity and you've got renal failure. So it's a case when something went wrong, it was a confusion. Somebody mixed the plants up. The result of that, when people, three patients died in the UK of renal failure, was the banning of a group of plants. But the headlines were toxicity associated with Chinese medicines, which is going to put the whole of the traditional Chinese medicine as if they were bad. And then it goes and percolates out to other European medicines. So I think there is a case for a better understanding and some form of regulation, especially if it is going to be served, uh, sold as a product. Because I think people need to know that they actually are getting something that's quality. That um, we have looked out, as Michael was saying earlier, about you know, contamination of the soil, etc. That we do know that there are no um, pesticides in that material, no contamination with heavy uh, pollutants, because of course our, our environment is polluted and plants are very good actually at taking up, unfortunately, accumulating and taking up some of those pollutants. We need to make sure that the material that we are using in complementary therapies is good quality. So just to give you then a few examples of some of the work that I've been involved with uh, other communities abroad. And one that really had a huge impact on me is work we were doing in um, South Africa. And that was just out with some communities outside um, Grahamstown. This was with a UK-based charity called Garden Africa, as well as a South African um, um, NGO called Mtati. Now, we were invited to come into the project to assist them with the propagation of the plants that they were wanting to treat um, their communities with. And this is an area where you've got high level of um, communities that really rely on plants for their primary source of medicines. They don't have the funds to be able to buy the westernized drugs to treat conditions like related to HIV. They rely on their plants. But there had been a change in land use in the area with the increase of big game farms. So the traditional healers weren't really able to collect their plants as easier, as easy as they had in the, in the past. You know, kind of um, game reserves and going out and collecting plants don't always go together. You know, you've got lions and other things in those, those areas. So they were wanting to propagate the plants. Now, they were very reluctant to tell us anything about the uses of those plants. Fair enough. Our role was to help propagate. And so we managed to get them an area of land that they could um, grow the plants in. And this is where kind of a scientifically based project, because we had to get funds for this, and we managed to get some from, uh, from DEFRA as a Darwin Initiative grant. And also, we've been able to get some funds from the EU. And that was to be able to purchase the land and for the training for um, some of the um, staff that we needed to have to help grow the material. Identified the plants, started to grow them, and then the traditional healers said, wait, stop, can you just stop, please? We need to bring the spirits with the plants. This is where you need really a group of people to help sometimes on these projects. As a scientist, thinking, OK, how do you bring the spirits with the plants? And they said, well, you know, one of the things is to bless the land. And you're kind of thinking, well, how many times when we move house do we actually, you know, bless the house and things like that? So kind of pretty obvious things. So we went through a ceremony and there was the blessing of the land, and then they, they sung some um, stories about the uses of the plants, kind of to bless some of the plants that they were using. Um, but then they kind of went, no, we need to do more than that. Okay, fine, what else do we need? We need to bring the spirits with the plants. How do we do that? Well, let's take some of the plants and just see if they're going to grow in that soil. And so we took a number of plants that they had selected 
We kept some of them in the area that they were growing. We took a subsample of that and we just transferred it to the land that we purchased. And then we took another sub subsample and we took the soil with the plants and we grow them. We got the permission from the healers. In fact, they helped us make some extracts of the plants so that we could study the chemistry of the plants. So we could get kind of a, like a chemical fingerprint to see, the idea here was to see if that chemical fingerprint, therefore the medicinal properties, because of course it's going to be the compounds in the plant that are going to be associated with the activity. Are they going to be different? We then did the experiment, and out of the plants that we looked at, six of those were incredibly different if we just planted them in the soil. We needed to take, kind of make sure the nutrient was, nutrients were um, the same as the soil that they'd been grown in. One of the key things in some of those plants was actually the mycorrhizae fungi that were associated with those plants in their natural habitat. It was a learning curve, and I think it's a mistake that we've actually often made. When we have identified a plant that has been used by a community, especially if it's gone in as a scientific project, you've identified it, you've taken it out, and then you start to look at it, a scientist comes along, or even a community comes along, and says, actually, that plant is not working as well. It's because we haven't taken enough care in actually selecting the plants. Now, there's some other examples. We don't need to go to South Africa on that. And, um, that is a more recent example. Now, if, most of my career, I've actually worked on plants in different parts of the world. So back to the Millennium Seed Bank project. The first goal of the Millennium Seed Bank project was actually to collect the seeds from the UK flora. Now, traditionally, we actually haven't done much work on the UK flora. So with a remit for the Millennium Seed Bank to collect seeds, we thought, what else can we do on the British flora? There's two things really happened. One, we got involved in the Ethnomedica uh, project, which is a remembered remedies project, which is now partly coordinated out of Kew. And you're welcome to take part in that because that's very much community-based project recording the traditional uses of plants. In UK, the initial aim was to collect the uses of plants prior to 1948. The significance of that being National Health Service coming in. And there was a big change when the National Health Service came in. People slightly moved away from traditional plants to kind of your, you know, your antibiotics from penicillin, etc. Now, the other aspect is we managed to get some funding at Kew to uh, evaluate the biological activities, the medicinal properties of some of the UK plants. So it's something we hadn't done before. So we have these t two projects. One is a plant law project, collecting information about the use, and then the other was more a scientific use. And we started to work with some of the herbalists in uh, UK about you know, which plants should we look at. Um, and Gabriel Hatfield was one of the herbalists that was very interested in seeing if we could support, understand the scientific rationale for some of the plants. And she suggested that we work on cleavers, gallium, because she was using it for treating wounds. I say, fine, thank you. Go to Kew, we actually could find some gallium, even though it's supposed to be weed-free, so it's a big garden. Uh, found some and um, made some extracts, got some tests. We, we'd done other work on kind of wound healing, so we had a nice system in, in the lab in collaboration with King's College to be able to do the testing. Nothing. Okay, got back to um, Gabriel. Doesn't actually work. You must be doing something else. So she said, kind of said, well, you know, what did you do? I said, we collected the plants. We dried it as we normally do. We made um, an ethanol extract. We took that to dryness and then we took it up and we started the test. And she was kind of saying, hmm, that's not how I use it. What I do 
is I gather it, and it, usually I gather it in the spring. I don't use it so much later on in the year. Interesting. We'd actually study material in kind of autumn times, right? The other thing that she does is that she uses it fresh as a poultice, replaced every two days. So what we did this time is we got material in the springtime. We um, freeze dried that material. By that, that process, we stop the breakdown of the compounds. So it'd be more like having a fresh material. We made an extract, we tested it, and we got activity. So just illustrating the importance of actually understanding how plants are used. When are they collected? What time of the year? There's other examples we could illustrate. For example, something like the ajugas um, change between after flowering, before and after flowering. The medicinal, if you really go back in time, people knew that the medicinal properties would change. But sometimes we've lost that. So I think it's really important to gather the information, have a better understanding and respect for those traditional uses of plants as we try and understand them. Because in this day in society, it's very different from when plants were used traditionally. So of course, when plants were used as the main form of medicines, people weren't taking westernized drugs. They weren't on warfarins, they weren't on statins, they weren't taking other prescribed drugs. And if you get a medicinal plant that really does work in combination then with something else that you're taking, that's where we can sometimes have adverse responses. So I think what we need to do going forward is this real respect for medicinal plants, how they work, but also this dialogue that patients actually need to take not only the herbalist, what they tell the herbalist what other drugs that they're taking, but their doctor about the herbs they're taking. The problem is, as I get said earlier on, often the doctors don't know enough about the plants to be able to give you an informed opinion about some interaction that might happen. So it's a very difficult kind of situation. But it's really great to have somewhere like this where you can learn more about the plants and other similar projects that are going on because it's clear that there is a growing interest in medicinal plants and understanding them and making sure that we are growing appropriate plants for the soil, um, etc., and kind of companion plants so they're actually working well together. And if you've um, some of you have some time on the internet. I would suggest you look at quite an inspirational program that's going on, Cities Alive, it's called, and it's with Arup. Arup are an engineering consultancy company, and you might say, why am I suggesting you look at something with them? It's because they're trying to capture nature in the development of cities for the future and really have something that works and supports biodiversity, so you don't, just don't get um, you know, concrete jungles, and having biodiversity that relates to the community and adds something to them. So I hope that gives you a bit of an overview of what we're doing. I'm quite willing to take questions.